joined tonight by Dr. Bill Housecamp. He's one of my partners. He's also a general surgeon, Dr. David Zink. He's one of our gastroenterologists locally here in the community. So thanks for coming out. It's a bigger group than I expected, so this is cool. It means that people are interested about this problem. Um, we're going to take probably 30 to 40 minutes to go over our slides, which will be packed with information, and then we'll move pretty quickly uh, through the slides into kind of a question-answer session. Um, if some of you have personal questions that relate to your personal circumstances, Taryn, one of our nurses in the back, Taryn, you got to wave, will we'll be here to um, take your name and your number, and she can work with you uh, by telephone to see you know, what's right for you, what testing may be necessary. But we'll certainly take general questions and all those things at the end. All right, should we get started? Um, I'm going to go over heartburn a little bit and make some definitions here. Um, that's kind of what we're here to learn more about. A lot of people have different names for heartburn, as it's listed up above. People call it acid reflux. People call it GERD. GERD stands for gastroesophageal reflux disease. Uh, as we move through uh, today, our goal is to review the symptoms of GERD or heartburn, to discuss some of the diagnostic treatments. We're going to explore medical and non-surgical options, and then, of course, review some of our surgical options for GERD. Um, everybody here knows or probably has heard about GERD. It's a common disease. It is, uh, I guess, one crack at defining it would be substernal discomfort burning that begins in your epigastric region, which is kind of the center of your abdomen, and moves upwards into your chest. Typically, 7% um, of adults in this country experience GERD on a daily basis, and almost 50% of adult Americans experience some episodes of GERD on a monthly basis. This is often recognized as a chronic disease, meaning that it requires some management, some medical management. So when we, we'll move on here, and I'll define what we feel are some of the typical and then some of the atypical symptoms. Um, this is a kind of the classic pose, somebody who's experiencing that burning sensation after, after eating. Um, so heartburn, that's a very common symptom. That's one of what we call the typical symptoms. So if you come see one of us in the office, we're definitely going to ask you about heartburn. We're going to ask you about regurgitation. That, that's kind of bringing things up, burping it up after you've eaten. Um, people describe a bitter taste in their mouth that stomach contents going up the esophagus and into the back of the throat. And then dysphagia is a difficulty swallowing. And we're going to ask everybody about this too. That's a sensation of food getting stuck. And that, that's maybe a late finding, but it is a typical symptom in patients with heartburn or GERD. Some of the more atypical symptoms are going to be a cough, hoarseness, chest pain, asthma, wheezing, and aspiration. A lot of these things are related to your respiratory system. If you're bringing up or burping up acid into your, into your throat, especially at night when you're less than conscious, you could be inhaling some of that acid into your lungs, and that can cause damage. So that's, that's one of the things that uh, we would define as an atypical finding, but still pretty common. Um, just a little data. This is a heavy slide. It just kind of goes over prevalence. How common is it? Um, a lot of people had nocturnal symptoms, 80% of people had symptoms at night. Um, many patients, about three quarters, take a prescription medication for heartburn on a regular basis. And about 45% report that their symptoms aren't relieved simply by um, medications only. So we're uh, here to kind of help define some of these uh, symptoms and what we can do about it. This slide shows the intersection of these typical symptoms, heartburn, regurgitation, and dysphagia. If you see where the circles meet, you know, again, that's about 64% of patients with all three. So that's the majority of the patients are going to have all three of these typical symptoms. Um, this gets into the science of, of why it happens. Why do we have gastroesophageal reflux? It's because there's an area of pressure in our lower esophagus, and it's defined as the lower esophageal sphincter. And uh, the lower esophageal sphincter is a pressure zone that sort of separates the stomach from the esophagus. As we eat food, food passes through that zone, and it's supposed to 
really protect us. It's like a barrier that prevents stomach contents from regurgitating into the esophagus. But as we get older, that zone of high pressure goes away. We end up um, basically losing that zone of high pressure and we, um, I, I think, have an increased risk. So it could be weakness, which is probably mostly just an aging thing. Could be, you know, a lot of factors on lifestyle, weight, diet, et cetera. And then the presence of a hiatal hernia. A hiatal hernia is a hernia at the junction between your stomach and your esophagus. It's actually a, a diaphragmatic hernia because it occurs through the region of the diaphragm. Uh, this is kind of an x-ray picture of somebody with a portion of their stomach herniating above their diaphragm. So the diaphragm would be here. This is the backbone. This is the diaphragm. This, is, this white stuff is contrast. And you can see the contrast is moving from the stomach into the uh, upper portion of the stomach and then into the esophagus. And this, this is an example of somebody who has a portion of their stomach riding up above their diaphragm. Um, so the hiatal hernias, in summary, are the most common reason for a dysfunction of your lower, esoph lower esophageal sphincter. The weakness or the defectiveness of that sphincter is because of the presence of a hernia. Patients with a hernia are often going to have esophageal inflammation. Um, these are the patients who are hardest to control with medications only. And these are the patients who we may want to consider for surgical intervention. So um, when one of the three of us evaluates you or discusses this with you in the office, this is certainly something we want to get to the bottom of. Um, I guess the, the question is, what if I do nothing? I mean, do I have to do anything? Do I have to take a pill every day? Do I have to have surgery? You know, the answer is, the answer is no. But if you don't, <clears throat> these are the risks. You can have respiratory problems, additional inflammation of the esophagus, scarring of the esophagus from the inflammation, from the acid. And then probably <clears throat> some of the worst things that can happen are going to be cancerous or precancerous changes. Uh, Barrett's esophagus is going to be discussed in detail by Dr. Zink tonight, so I'll just fast forward through that. But he'll detail what that means. That's a precancerous change. And I think we all kind of know what esophageal cancer can do to us. And that's one of the long-term sort of bad outcomes of somebody with chronic reflux who doesn't get treatment. Um, some of the things we try to do, we don't, we're not quick to operate. We want to modify people's diets, avoid large meals, eat slowly, avoid these probably everything we like, chocolate, caffeine, <laughs> carbonated, I mean, basically anything that tastes good, you can't have it. Um, we should lose weight. We should exercise more. We all, we all have heard about the obesity crisis we're having. Lifestyle changes fall into that category. But, you know, as a, as a standalone issue, medical management is very effective at suppressing acid in the stomach. And if you block the acid, acid blocking medications can inhibit damage to the, to the esophagus. So that's kind of a goal of therapy. Um, these are some examples of how how we can change our lifestyle. Um, I have patients who have elevated their beds. They will put their bed up on a block of wood. They will get the bed up tilted to a certain, you know, 15, 20 degrees. Um, they don't eat at bedtime or right before bedtime. Smoking can re increase the risk. So can alcohol. And tight-fitting clothing is known to be a bit of a risk. Um, these are some of the examples of acid blocking medications on the market. A lot of these are actually available now without a prescription. You can get them at the pharmacy. Um, I'm not going to get into how they work, but these are just good examples of medications that do work and medications that I think all three of us endorse and use in our patients. Again, 95%, I said this at the beginning of the lecture, 95% of patients will have relief of their symptoms with medication alone. So the amount of people that we operate on is actually a pretty low number because they end up not needing a, an operation. Um, Dr. Housecamp's going to take over and talk to you all about some preoperative tests. These are some of the medical tests that can be done here at Holland Hospital through the Reflux Center. And um, he'll talk a little about some of the surgical procedures as well. So thanks for your attention. So uh, my name is Dr. Housecamp. Um, there is uh, multiple different factors get to a point before we would consider some of these interventions. Uh, a lot of it is, a, is a listening to, again, your history. Uh, we, we find that 
that sometimes up, like up to 60% of patients with their, with their history, uh, we don't always find that what sounds like reflux turns out to be reflux. And the medicines that, that Brian mentioned, they're so effective that if we, we think someone has reflux based on their symptoms and history, and, and uh, if we treat them with, with medicines and they don't respond, and they don't have improvements in their symptoms, it, they're so effective that makes you step back and say, well, is it truly reflux or is there something else going on? Um, a lot of the times we just uh, uh, think it's reflux and sometimes you have to look for other things. And that's where a lot of these other tests, tests go into play. Um, upper endoscopy, uh, of course, is something that uh, some of you may have had. And, uh, and when do we get it? Um, uh, it will depend on some of their symptoms, how, how long they've had reflux. If you all think back and say, well, I've had reflux for a long time. At what point, uh, you may have been on medicines for a long time. At, at what point do you think, well, should I have had one, haven't had one yet. We talk about maybe having a, a considering and looking into your esophagus if you've had reflux for five years or longer and that's been, been treated uh, to a point to make sure there's not some of these complications that can occur and some of them being what Dr. Zink will talk about. Uh, an upper endoscopy entails, it's, uh, it's a small procedure, but there's always some risk to that. You have to be uh, sedated. We, we do, it's a mini procedure, um, no risk of, uh, Procedure is low, but not zero, so it's at least something we want to have a good reason to do that. So those are at least times when we start thinking about it. But we learn a lot of information of, um, from what's going on. We get an evaluation of what the esophagus looks like, make sure there's no inflammation that's significant, no Barrett's esophagus, no cancers. Uh, again, if you looked at some of those symptoms, there's a lot of different things that can cause pain up here. We think of all the structures that live there, be it the, the stomach, ulcers, gallbladder. So there's a lot of different things we have to think of. And when we're looking here, we're also uh, being able to tell, well, is there, is there an ulcer? Does that person have an abnormal bacteria in their stomach that can cause pain? Um, we evaluate for a hiatal hernia that, that Dr. Dissinger mentioned. The hiatal hernia is the opening in our diaphragm. We have a natural opening where our esophagus goes through that has to chest, separate our chest cavity from our belly cavity, and that opening gets bigger with time. If we have a big opening, and then that's going to contribute to reflux. We get a sense of that when we take a look, as well, well as rule out really bad things that we all worry about if we've had things for years, like, like even a cancer of the esophagus or a cancer of the stomach, and things like an ulcer. So we often start there. Um, Esophageal, uh, if we go to the next, uh, or two down to the video swallow, uh, that's where you drink contrast. So that is uh, something that's been done a lot longer. It's less invasive because uh, you're not having any uh, sedation and there's no procedure where something's getting pushed down your throat. Uh, we learn a lot of things from that as well, from how things slide down. We get evaluation for uh, a little bit of the motility, meaning how well does our esophagus push things down. We can see again, like Dr. Dissinger's uh, picture of where the, whether we have a hiatal hernia, that uh, how big it is if our stomach's up here as opposed to being in the abdomen where it's supposed to be. Motility study is a fancy term to describe how well we're looking to see if someone's esophagus pushes our food down normally. Uh, just like we don't run as fast as we get older and some of those things we don't see as well, sometimes our esophagus doesn't push things down as well and other times there's other medical reasons for that. The uh, pH study, uh, there's different ways that we do that. Well, basically, the, what we're trying to do is measure the acid in the esophagus over anywhere from a 24-hour window up to a three-day window. Uh, there are, again, times when patients feel like their symptoms. It sounds like the symptoms are reflux. And then when we do a study like that, we actually can measure, well, how much acid is in the esophagus. And patients can write down symptoms. And we can correlate every time they had symptoms. And we look, and there was actually no acid in their, in their esophagus during that time. So it's kind of our gold standard to say, well, okay, this is, you're having symptoms, but it's not necessarily reflux. Importance of the upper uh, endoscopy, we kind of talked about that. Things that we can uh, learn from it. We do biopsies, not always. Uh, if we're looking for atypical cells, signs of esophagitis, signs of uh, Barrett's esophagus that, that Dave will talk about, all things that we can uh, really learn a lot from as well as looking for other factors. The pH study is, again, um, there's two different ways that we do it when we're trying to measure the acid. One, we actually uh, put a probe that goes down, and, and, and you, you walk around with that for 24 hours, and we tell patients to do their normal things. Um, and it comes out the nose. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty hard to do. Uh, we learn a lot from it, though. Uh, but it's hard for people to go do their normal routines, which is what we want, like go to, go to work and eat normally. 
there's another study that we call the, the Bravo study, and, and that's, a, that's a pretty fascinating thing too. And, and what that is, when you have your uh, scope, uh, what happens is we put a little chip that it sits in the distal esophagus about six centimeters above between this esophagus and the stomach, and that actually measures the acid over that 48 to 72 hour window, and it sends it to a little computer that you wear, and it sends that information, and that during that same time, you write down your symptoms that you're having, and we try to correlate acid reflux, how much acid reflux actually occurs when you're, when you're up, when you're laying down, when you're sleeping, what happens after a meal, correlate it with symptoms, and you don't have to actually have something coming out of your, your nose the whole time. That's, again, um, something that uh, we do over anywhere from 48 hours to 72 hours, and that little chip basically passes in your stools over usually 7 to 10 days. And then we get that information, we put it all together and read it. Kind of talked about that. Um, manometry can be a real important important factor for both looking at reflux as well as looking for atypical symptoms. We will have patients who uh, it sounds like reflux and and everything about their history. They may or may not have responded initially to medicines that we would typically treat with reflux, such as a PPI therapy, omeprazole, something like that. And then we're considering that. We take a look, and we really don't find much of a hiatal hernia. Their pH study might not really show much of a uh, of that they don't have anything more than what we would call a normal physiological reflux. And then you start thinking for other things, and and then we might be wanting to know about well, how well does that person's esophagus actually push things through? And that's what we're looking at manometry. Um, there's a lot of different things that can happen in our esophagus related to how it propulses, and there's different things where it doesn't propulse correctly, or it goes into a spasm, or the sphincter that the lower esophageal sphincter doesn't relax appropriately. We not only learn how well that sphincter, the pressure of it, which can be relaxed and as, get, as we get older, get more relaxed leading to reflux, but it also can be too high. So we don't have a normal release and our esophagus can't push things through. So there are a lot of other things that can cause symptoms up here and that's where uh, it can be tricky and where a gastroenterologist works through all those type of things. And it's not always just GERD. That's why they're having symptoms. Um, the uh, important thing from a surgical standpoint, particularly as we cut farther along, if for, for me as a surgeon, if we're going to think of recreating that valve or somehow uh, making that a, a, a either fixing a hiatal hernia or making that tight so no longer acid can reflux into our esophagus, if we do that in someone whose esophagus doesn't push things through and we create a pressure, then they're not going to be able to push the food through. So it just gets hung up where we recreate that valve because we haven't looked at the motility of the esophagus. So then we've, they don't have reflux anymore, but they can't eat. So that we've solved one problem and given them another. Um, so that's a real in, important test that we do before considering any type of, of surgery is to we want to know, make sure their, their, their esophagus works normally. So uh, before someone... Uh, ever gets to a point where we even consider surgery, there's a fair amount of testing that goes into place and to decide who would even be a consideration for surgery. There's different types of surgeries that we do. Um, there's different types of situations where, where surgery can be done, but it may not be the best scenario for that patient, depending on their overall health status, their, um, their medical status, uh, their weight. A lot of different factors have to go into that. When we're thinking about doing reflux surgery, we really want to recreate that valve. And that can be uh, done in several different ways. So where surgery can be extremely beneficial is someone who actually has a hiatal hernia, particularly if it's, it's very big. So when we have a hiatal hernia and we put someone on PPI therapy, meaning something as strong as uh, omeprazole, Prilosec, Nexium, there's all different name brands. Some people respond better to others. Um, but when we put them on that and they actually have a, an anatomical defect, just like if you had a belly button hernia or a groin hernia, it bulges out. Well, if you have an actual anatomical defect of the diaphragm, even if we're putting someone on acid reflux, they, they might respond initially, might respond well, but they, if their main complaint is not necessarily heartburn, which the medicine can help with, but regurgitation, and they have that anatomical defect, that process is still occurring and we're not changing that by the medical management that we do. 
So if they eat, uh, if, if, if you, it's like heartburn. If you've never had heartburn, no one really knows what it is. Most of us are in this room, so we probably know what heartburn is. But that feeling when you eat and then maybe you bend over and food comes to the back of your throat, um, or when you lay down and at times you wake up at night and you'll have stuff come to the back of your throat, be it bile, um, or some, sometimes you even wake up with, with stuff all the way in the back of the throat and they're coughing. Uh, a lot of those patients have a significant high hernia that the medicines just won't, won't fix. And those are the times when we're, we're really focusing in is repairing their hiatal hernia and, and because of the uh, anatomical defect. The other thing that occurs with that is we'll have patients who have a lot of silent reflux, and Dr. Um, Dissinger mentioned that, where they have the atypical symptoms of reflux that occurs without heartburn, but they have the coughs or sore throat or the asthma. A lot of those patients are seen first by a pulmonologist or they're seeing, seen by an ear, and, ear, nose, and throat doctor for a sore throat or a cough. And those are going to be other more difficult a diagnosis to determine. And when you work through those patients and you work through their history and a lot of tests, you might find those patients actually also have a hiatal hernia and they don't necessarily have GERD as their main component, but it's a lot of upper uh, pharyngeal type symptoms and those patients do best if they have a hiatal hernia as opposed to not really having much of a sphincter defect. Those are harder to get good results from. The classic surgery that we do is essentially close the hiatal hernia if they have one so we fix it, meaning if their stomach's in their chest, we want to pull that back into it in their abdomen where they're supposed to be. The defect, which can be amazingly big and we'll have patients with their with not only their stomach, but their colon can be pulled up, their spleen, which our spleen sits back here, can be pulled up into the, uh, into the chest cavity. The whole stomach can be in the chest cavity. Those are the, obviously the extremes, but we want to pull that back into the abdomen where they're, where they're supposed to be and then close, tighten that hiatal hernia just as if you'd fix a hernia of the abdominal wall that we more commonly think of. And then on top of that, we do some form of a fancy term for that as a fundiplication where Essentially, uh, this is a picture of showing the, the opening in the diaphragm, and we fix the hole where the esophagus goes through. Here's the esophagus right there. There's the stomach. This is the esophagus going through. So the, this is the opening in the diaphragm that can be very wide, and that's what we surgically repair. So we'll fix the hiatal hernia. This is just showing the liver, which is, will drape the, the stomach in the area we're trying to work. And then the fundiplication is a fancy term where the top part of our stomach, which we call the fundus, we, we wrap around the esophagus. The, the best example is always used as kind of like a hot dog on a bun, where you take the part, upper part of the stomach and you wrap it around the uh, esophagus and that recreates that valve. So that combined with, with closing the hernia. The whole goal is to recreate that barrier that's supposed to be there that for all different reasons has been, has been uh, lost. Um, there's all different ways that gets out of what we, what we need to think about from different surgeries, from how we do the wrap and how extensive the wrap is from a partial wrap to a, to a full wrap to sometimes it's done through the abdomen, sometimes it needs to be done through the chest cavity. There's a lot of different possibilities that, uh, that are kind of outside of where we need to go here. Uh, but that's the, the classic gold standard of what's been done for years. Some of the um, more recent uh, procedures that are, that are done, the whole goal is just like when we fix hernias and, and other things, we try to do them through the smallest incisions, be it the prostate surgery now done with robotic da Vinci machine, or you get your, uh, your hysterectomy that way, and as opposed to the old-fashioned way, everything we try to do through the smallest incisions to get patients back to work the quickest and back to their normal activities. So uh, some of the, the, the newer things that we do is one's called the Lynx procedure. You may have heard of that. Um, we'll pass this around. But what that does is it's essentially, it's uh, think of something like you'd wear on your wrist um, like that. And what it allows, what it goes is that that gets placed in the distal esophagus right between our esophagus and our stomach. And that has little titanium beads and, and they pull together. So what happens is when we put that around patients' esophagus, it enables that it can open up as we swallow our food and then closes back up and it's just tight enough that it creates that barrier that things won't reflux up. But yet it's not, 
it's flexible and allow stuff to go through. The uh, benefit of doing that is it saves that when we fix a hiatal hernia, we're just closing the hole. When we actually do the fundiplication, that fancy term described the, the uh, wrapping the stomach around the esophagus, now we're kind of changing the whole anatomy. And this, that part of the procedure we don't do. We just are able to put that uh, around the esophagus. The uh, upside about it is is it tends to be a smaller operation. We don't have to mobilize the stomach, which is attached to our spleen. Um, there's less the dissection to do. And it has been shown to be very effective. The other thing about it is it's, 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 if it doesn't work, if it's not helping, there you, it, or if uh, patients do develop what we call dysphagia, that fancy term again where food doesn't go down, you can remove it as opposed to once you do that wrap, you're kind of stuck with it. It's, it's, you, can re you can take it down, but it's a lot, it's difficult and it's a, a, a big deal. Those procedures can be done even on an outpatient basis where patients go home the same day. And this in fundifications and any type of reflux surgery really wor it works well, but everything has a downside. So. Um, there's always small risk of bleeding. There's small risk of infection. The, the esophagus lives in that area that can be injured. We have the spleen that lives in that area that can be injured. Um, we can make the wrap too tight so patients can't swallow. Again, getting to the, uh, the, the concept, well, I don't have reflux, but I can't get food to go down. Um, they can, don't, they, if, if uh, particularly with some types of surgery, we make the valve great, but they can't burp, and, and that leads to more gas the other way. Uh, it can lead to a fullness, bloating. Um, we will have uh, patients described as like gas bloat after, after eating because they can't belch. Uh, sometimes patients can't throw up. Ideally, they can do all of that, but some, that's definitely something that is a downside of surgery. Uh, with that little thing that's going through there, we call the Lynx procedure. Ideally, you, we get less gas bloat. We have less increased flatulence. We have uh, less, um, uh, we still have the ability to throw up if we're sick. So in summary, um, complex, there's a lot of things that we think about and uh, part of it is really deciding if you really have reflux and, uh, and, and deciding how best to treat it. Um, there's surely lots of times, um, you know, we see our primary and it sounds like reflux but we put you on medicine and we don't necessarily know that's truly what it is. Um, and that's where uh, uh, if, if you're on medicine and it's not helping, it really makes you step back because the medicines work so well that maybe it's not reflux, and, and that's where uh, seeing someone like Dr. Zink to work that through is, uh, is, is very helpful. All right, I'm gonna have uh, doc, Dr. Zink will talk about one of a major complication of, of uh, untreated GERD for years, and that's Barrett's esophagus and what we do for it. Well, thank you, Bill and Brian, nice, nice talk so far, I have about 10 or 15 more slides, so about 10, 10 more minutes of your time before we get into the question and answer section. I want to introduce, um, uh, you know, Barrett's esophagus and get into it a little bit more detail. And then also discuss um, a new technology that we have available here called um, radio frequency ablation for Barrett's esophagus. Um, and uh, it's, it's been around since about uh, 2005, so um, but it is new here, and we're, we're, we're having a lot of success with it, so I wanted to, to share that with you. So when is it more than just heartburn, GERD and Barrett's esophagus, as well as esophageal cancer? So this will be helpful. Some of this is redundant, but just to reiterate, heartburn may be a symptom of gastroesophageal reflux disease, okay? So as Brian talked about, the, the acid from the stomach coming up into the esophagus gives us heartburn. And most commonly, heartburn is from GERD. Um, normally, the valve at the lower end of the esophagus opens and allows food to pass and closes once food gets into the stomach. But often, that valve is incompetent, and that's when we develop GERD, as we've reviewed before. So again, some statistics, up to 40% of the U.S. population is affected by GERD during their lifetime, so it is a huge problem. One in five experience symptoms of GERD on a weekly basis, and about 30% fail to respond to their medication. The 
these are things that um, Dr. Housecamp went over. I don't want to get into them in extreme detail. But um, one of the things that we do when we use the 20 the 24 hour pH monitor, the one that, that is that we use that is a catheter that is placed through the nose is also do um, impedance testing. So that, that measures material other than just acid, because some people will have acid refl will have reflux that is non-acid. So the impedance portion of that test measures actually non-acid reflux, the, the bile and other material that can come up and cause irritation that may not respond to acid-reducing medications. The other, med the other test that were mentioned was the high-resolution manometry. That's the, that's the pressure testing, again, to assess that swallow function. The motility testing um, is something that we don't offer here, but it, 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 in some centers, it's to check motility actually throughout the entire GI tract, something that's not used very, very often. So what is Barrett's? Um, as Brian alluded to, it's a complication of gastroesophageal reflux disease. So years of reflux will lead to this change in the base of the esophagus. So what you're looking at here is you're basically looking down the esophagus, okay? So this, the bottom here is where, where the stomach uh, begins, okay? So as the acid comes up from the stomach, it, it bathes the lower part of the esophagus, and you get this change in the lining of the tissue called Barrett's esophagus. It's considered uh, precancerous, meaning the change in the lining of the tissue is a type of tissue that's more prone to turn into cancer. Okay? So it, it, it's, it's the soil in which esophageal cancer grows, basically. And if you, if you, you can get esophageal cancer without Barrett's, of course, but it is a, it, with Barrett's, your risk is a lot higher. So I, I think this shows pretty well. Um, this is a normal, healthy-looking esophagus. This is looking down again, down the food tube, the esophagus. The stomach opening is right there. You can kind of see in this, this is, this is erosive esophagitis. This is when acid has damaged the esophagus, but not to the point of Barrett's. So it's a reversible condition when it's when it's just in this state, it's erosive. Esophagitis meaning it, it's eroded through the natural tissues and you get ulcers. And often this is when people start feeling the discomfort. Um, that can bleed. It can, there can be serious complications. It can stricture, as, as Brian mentioned. And then after years of, of acid exposure, you, you develop you, you can develop, not everyone gets it, but you can develop Barrett's esophagus, and you can see it's that change in the lining. The tissue has actually changed from a, one type to another, and it's the other type of tissue that's more prone to cancer. So if you've had this a while, you have a chance of developing a dysplastic Barrett's, which is just a, a, a term for um, where the cells of the esophagus have actually change to a point where they're getting close to being cancer. That's what we mean by dysplasia. So here is what we would call nodular uh, Barrett's. Um, so that's actually a progression of this, this flat Barrett's to a dysplastic nodular type Barrett's. And then if left untreated long enough, you can develop esophageal cancer. So basically, there's a lot of studies that have looked at the, the, the risk of progression. And there's some mixed data, but Basically, if you have Barrett's without dysplasia, your odds of cancer are a little bit less than 1% um, per year. Okay? With dysplasia, it goes up to maybe 2 to 5% per year. Okay? And then once you get um, a, within the dysplastic realm, there's low grade and high grade. Once you get into the high-grade dysplasia, your risks are very high. You can get up into the 15 20% chance of getting esophageal cancer every year. So that's why we want to halt this progression. Interestingly, the, the uh, esophageal cancer 
rates are growing, as you can see exponentially here. While other things have remained flat or have had only slight increases. I don't know if you folks can see this in the back, but this is the line for the esophageal cancer. So the risk of esophageal cancer is growing. Uh, whereas, as you can see as an example of another thing that we, as gastroenterologists, like to, to dwell on is colorectal cancer. And we think with the, the screening that we're, we're performing, the rates are actually going down. Um, and then some other cancers in here, if you can't see in back. Here's lung cancer. A green, the yellow is lung cancer. The green is breast cancer. A prostate cancer is up uh, slightly. Melanoma is more common. And then this is just taking off. And the thoughts are um, because of um, lifestyle issues, primarily um, more patients being overweight. So if detected early, Barrett's esophagus can be effectively treated with a therapy called radiofrequency ablation. That's the, the technology I was referring to at the beginning of the, the talk. It's a procedure in which heat is used to remove the tissue affected by Barrett's esophagus. It has a, a very good success rate, 90% or more of, um, of getting rid of, percent chance of getting rid of the Barrett's. It's a, it's a technique that's, con, that's performed during an upper endoscopy, so during the, an EGD. And we use a catheter through the uh, endoscope. Um, and sometimes separate, there's different catheters. I won't get into the details, but some of the catheters are used through the endoscope or the, the scope that we use to look into the esophagus. And some of the catheters are used uh, separately. They're placed without the use of the endoscope. But basically, the, the catheter is, is placed down. It's inflated, and it automatically adjusts to the size of your esophagus. And it sends a circumferential or a, a circular burst of energy um, to the esophagus to actually burn that Barrett's tissue. And as that and over time, that Barrett's tissue just falls off and health, healthy tissue replace is, gets replaced. The, uh, the treatment requires, um, during one visit, there'll be a couple ablations, so repeat ablation. And then um, after return visits, then there's touch-ups. It takes maybe two, three visits for complete ablation, depending on the extent of Barrett's. And by extent, I mean some people just have short segments, a couple centimeters, and some people have, you know, 10 centimeters, just long segments of Barrett's. So the longer the segment, the little, little bit longer it takes to treat. So again, I, just to be clear here, uh, just in case it's, it's not, but this is the esophagus, the stomach, and then this catheter is placed down. In this instance, this is with the endoscope, next to the endoscope, and then when you do the touch-up, it's actually through the, uh, either through it, this doesn't show it, or attached to the end of the endoscope. So here's an example of a nice success story. Um, here's Barrett's. Uh, you can see that abnormal tissue, the white being normal, abnormal being the Barrett's, very extensive. And then this is after probably about three treatments, completely normal. So who is a candidate for this, this RFA, which is the, the Barrett's ablation? Anyone with dysplasia um, in the Barrett's, so that advanced cell that I talked about, a definite, definite um, candidate. Other than that, it gets a little bit uh, gray. Um, and the, and the data is becoming, as the data becomes more and more robust or more and more patients are treated, we'll know exactly who's going to benefit from this. But at this point, um, these are risk factors, okay? The more risk factors you have, the more likely it will be of benefit to have the treatment. But not everyone with Barrett's is someone who would want to get RFA. So I'll just give an example, um, just a generic patient I may have. 
if I have a young male who may be obese, smoke, and have a long segment of Barrett's, I would consider him for radiofrequency ablation. Okay. Now, if you're an older male, okay, with a shorter shorter segment of Barrett's, maybe less than three centimeters, um, might not be a candidate for RFA. But these are all things that I address personally in the office at a consultation, and we kind of add up the risks and see if it would be worthwhile. But not everyone is a candidate who has Barrett's. So just to go through these, uh, male increases your risk of Barrett's by about 7% compared to females. If you're white, it's a, a higher risk as well compared to other racial groups. So about two to five times higher than Caucasians. Um, if you're obese, depending on your BMI, the risk is increased from t two to three times the, the uh, a thinner population. Smoking increases your risk of esoph esophageal cancer. Uh, Barrett's, so the longer your segment of Barrett's, as I alluded to, the higher your risk of uh, cancer. And then family history. So, and just to show with a family history, your, your risk is about six times higher. So add these up, you know, there, you may be a candidate. It just depends. We have personal con consultations with everyone before this is performed. We discuss um, the risks and benefits. So to recap, heartburn and other reflux symptoms may be a sign of a more serious disease such as Barrett's. A complete portfolio of tests may be needed to make a diagnosis. Um, you may experience an absence of symptoms and believe the disease has gotten better when it actually it, it may have progressed to Barrett's. It's usually that uh, sometimes pa patients have had reflux and it's not, and, and then it miraculously goes away and it could be because they've Replace the bottom of the esophagus with Barrett's and they have less sensation because of that. Uh, Barrett's uh, can in turn progress to cancer, as I mentioned. And then early treatment with RFA can effectively remove Barrett's before the disease progresses. So that's, that's what I have to offer. Uh, and we're going to take some questions. And just as a point, because this has come up before when I've given these talks, my office is on Lakewood, and I do 90% of my endoscopy here. Um, so I'm local.